All right, so this lecture is going to be on chapter 10, which covers marine ecology. <clears throat> now, ecology is the study of living organisms and their interaction with other living organisms within an area, and also the abiotic factors, the <clears throat> non-living factors, which also may affect its life. Um, so, for example, uh, in a marine ecosystem, uh, somebody might study the effect of pollutants on uh, life within a certain area um, in the marine environment. Um, and so those pollutants would constitute an abiotic factor, something that's not living, which is affecting life. Um, and he may, the scientist, he or she may be studying um, one species or maybe multiple species and maybe even looking at the interactions between all those species in the presence of this pollutant. Um, ecologists may also be studying a specific ecosystem, so maybe the intertidal ecosystem here, the living things which are here, the inputs um, which affect the life there and the interactions of living things. Alright, so some terms which are important for ecology <coughs> include, um, and we've gone over some of these, a community Okay, which is all the populations of organisms living in de a defined area. So it includes, um, if you were going to look at this intertidal area here, um, these mussels and maybe the starfish, and other species of mussels and barnacles and other things, which are all living in the same area. So multiple different types of species. The habitat then is this physical place where an organism lives, the physical structure in which it uses. Um, to live to gain resources and finally a niche which is both the biotic and abiotic resources that an organism uses for survival growth and reproduction okay so uh, every population needs uh, specific things in order to live in order to survive and reproduce um, and there's generally a tolerance level in which a, a species or a population can thrive um, and then another range in which they will be able to survive but maybe not thrive um, and of course then there's a limit to that in which they won't be able to survive at all so some of the important uh, needs of a population include nutrients light space oxygen or carbon dioxide um, inorganic compounds and generally there is one or very few of these resources which limits the growth of a species it limits the population growth um, and so this is going to vary depending on what ecosystem you are looking at so this here is an intertidal zone and you can see probably the limiting resource here is space being able to establish and anchor yourself onto a substrate um, they are also going to have to deal with the with waves crashing onto the shore and the incoming and outcoming of tides, so all that will affect things like temperature, light, availability, um, salinity, all those things. And this is going, of course, be different if you're looking at the rise, the slope, uh, and on the sea floor. All right, so there is a point at which um, the resources available are going to, um, together, limit the amount of organisms in a specific area and that is called the well that the number of organisms that can live there is called the carrying capacity beyond that it will use more resources um, than can be replenished and the population will decrease with that um, as a population reaches its carrying capacity, its growth rate will decline um, and generally will reach some sort of uh, equilibrium or stability at carrying capacity. Alright, so some of the interactions then between different species um, are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, and some are going to be neutral. Okay, and so the different combinations of those uh, we have characterized into different types of interactions. So competition, predator-prey interactions, and symbioses are some of the ones we're going to talk about. So first, competition 
occurs when organisms require the same limiting resource in space and time. Okay, so here we have two hermit crabs which are fighting over a shell. Okay, um, this would be an example of intraspecific competition. Intra meaning um, within, so within a species, these two are fighting over a resource or competing over a resource. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, you might have interspecific competition where two different species are competing for the same resource. So these um, sea urchins and um, and sea stars um, may be both competing for space on the sea floor here. Okay. Um, or over here we have some clownfish, there's multiple clownfish around the sea anemone. Um, if they are competing for this resource, then that would be intraspecific competition. Alright, with interspecific competition, some experiments have been done to show the, the principle of um, competitive exclusion, where no two species can inhabit the same niche in the same space and time that if they do that, eventually one will outcompete the other and replace it. So to avoid com competition, what species will do is partition the resources, which is using a resource at a different time or in a different way. Okay? So um, the niche then, um, like we said, is the resources that it uses um, that a species will use. Um, there's different ways to look at the niche. You can look at the fundamental niche, which is the potential or the capability of a resource a species is able to use. And then there's the realized niche, which is the actual resources a species uses. Uh, and competition affects the niche, okay? And so there was uh, an experiment, a classic experiment done with a species of barnacles in the intertidal zone where uh, Joseph uh, Connell what he did is he took these he looked at these two species of barnacle and he would remove one species and see if the other species would uh, colonize that area um, and what he found was that if you remove move the Balanus species here the Thamalus species would be able to um, inhabit that lower area so it had a much larger fundamental niche. However, the Balana species was more competitive in that area. So they were better able to establish and use that resource. So when in the presence of Balana species, Thalamus was outcompeted. And however, uh, Thalamus was more effective at these higher um, points in the <clears throat> inner tidal zone. And so Balanus when the Thamalus the, the was uh, removed, could not, um, could not actually establish in that upper high tide area. And so its, real, its fundamental niche was the same as its realized niche. All right, uh, symbioses are where another one, two species interact where one lives in, on, or really close to another species. The symbi symbiont is the smaller partner, generally, and the host is the larger part partner, although this, is, this can be hard to characterize sometimes, depending on the size of the species. Okay, but some examples here include this cleaner sh shrimp and this eel, this remora, uh, which has suction cups on its head where it can... Um, attached to sharks and stingrays, and these clownfish which live with these uh, sea anemones. All right, so three different types that we're going to talk about are commensala commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. In mutualism, it's a positive interaction between both. In uh, commensalism, you have one species benefits and the other one doesn't. In parasitism, one species benefits and the other is harmed. Okay, so in mutualism, um, you have, so the example is this, you have an eel here. And this is a cleaner uh, wrasse, which is a uh, type of 
fish that will actually hang out in specific areas and when different fish come here it will actually come and clean the teeth, mouth, gills and other areas of the eel. So it gets a free meal and the eel gets um, a free cleaning so they're both mutually beneficial in their relationship. A commensalism where one benefits and there's no apparent um, effect on the other would be like barnacles which live on um, whales okay they can establish on their skin doesn't really affect the whale but the barnacles then get a substrate where they can um, access nutrients parasitism an example of that would be like a, um, a lamprey which attaches to the outside of an animal and sucks its blood or an in endoparasite where let's say a, a parasitic worm may live within the intestinal tract of a larger animal. Some symbioses are facultative, meaning they're convenient but not necessary. Um, and some of them are obligate, where, where they are required for the animal to live. So for example, the cleaner shrimp on the eel, um, the cleaner shrimp could probably go to other areas and clean them off and find food that way and the eel could probably live with the debris and things on its mouth and eyes and gills and stuff so it's not necessarily necessary for life more of a facultative symbiosis but it still definitely helps both um, this uh, this lamprey attaching to this fish this is probably obligate for the lamprey of course not obligate for the the fish um, and this is another one which may have maybe either but I'm not sure you'd have to do a little more research in but these little sea anemones will actually attach to the ends of the claws of these um, crabs it's called a pom-pom crab um, and this may be facultative or obligate I'd have to look a little more into whether or not these uh, sea anemones can live without the crab and if the crab could live without the sea anemones all right, predation then is kind of like parasitism, but one of them dies, right? Where one of them gets eaten by the other one. Um, a lot of species in the marine ecosystem will camouflage themselves or produce um, hardened shells or warning coloration or poisonous substances in order to evade uh, predators. Or they may develop these like, yeah, so this is a chitin, it has eight rows of uh, hardened plates that it uses as defense against predators. All right, so now we're going to move on to talk about ecosystems. Again, this is all the biotic and abiotic components within a defined area, and it requires a constant input of energy. Um, and so chemicals and nutrients are cycled within ecosystems, including you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, carbon, uh, water. Um, those are going to go through living things and also um, be affected by non-living things. All right, so energy is one of those systems which, or one of those components which um, flows through a system through living things. Um, and the route of energy is determined by a trophic structure, which we um, diagra uh, diagram as a food chain or a food web. Food webs are a little more accurate because it shows the complex dynamics of, of organisms eating m multiple different things. Generally, an organism doesn't just eat one thing, it has a variety of things it eats. Okay, but energy is passed from one level to another as things are eaten through predation. Okay, so on average about 10% of the energy is made available to the next trophic level. So um, phytoplankton and algae um, and cyanobacteria uh, make up the base of our food um, webs where they are going through photosynthesis 
and making energy available for the next level. Um, and they're about 10% of these next level, these zooplankton, compared to the phytoplankton because a lot of the energy is lost as waste. So this uh, makes for this food pyramid and is why there are less predators uh, than primary producers and why there is a generally three, four, or five um, levels is as high as we can go. All right, so a sixth level consumer on a food web is um, very high. Okay, this is an apex predator, and there aren't, in as, as if you measured biomass of killer whales, they wouldn't measure um, nearly as much as the producers, uh, and the producers would be should be. Uh, 10 times as much as the first level primary consumers and so on and so forth. All right, so some of the marine environments in, um, include the benthos, where the benthic organisms live in, on, or near the bottom of the ocean uh, along a substrate. Okay, this can be subdivided into um, different types of the benthos, including the intertidal zone between high and low tide and the subtidal zone, which is below the low tide. Okay, um, pelagic organisms live in the water column, so not along the sea floor. There's not a lot of in the 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 water column, so this is generally not as abundant in um, marine life as along the benthos. We can break the pelagic um, ecosystem into uh, different zones. The first um, is the epipelagic zone which goes from 0 to 200 meters then the mesopelagic zone from 200 to 1000 meters and then the deep sea zones bathypelagic, abyssopelagic and heteropelagic zones okay so here is a figure which has our uh, different benthos okay subtidal and intertidal zones were the first ones we talked about there's also um, the deep sea floor, which goes along with the different deep sea um, zones we talked about before. Um, and so this is a good figure we'll go through in class. All right, finally we're going to talk about cycles, but just really we're going to talk about the carbon cycle. But other nutrients also cycle through the marine environment, including nitrogen and phosphorus. Now the carbon cycle, okay, also has to do with the energy cycle but also includes what happens to carbon dioxide or carbon um, even after things are done eating it right so carbon originally comes from the atmosphere which is dissolved into the ocean and then through photosynthesis is turned into sugars it leaves living organisms through the respiration where carbon dioxide is breathed out um, back into the ocean where it is dissolved. However, not all of it is, is um, released through respiration. Some of it is undigested and will sink to the sea floor where decomposers will then um, release it into the um, into the back into the dissolved ocean through carbon dioxide um, but even then some of those will not uh, you know the decomposers will not fully get through everything either and so some of that will just remain on the sea floor and will gather as uh, marine sediments so gross primary production is that initial autotrophic level where um, photosynthesis is occurring and net primary production is how much is available for um, made available by primary producers so it's available for primary consumers and this makes the base of our trophic pyramid phytoplankton are the main primary producers again that includes algae and cyanobacteria um, and the standing stock then is the total amount of phytoplankton within a marine environment. And so you would measure that by looking at um, algae, um, 
that is growing off of the sea floor, um, and then a lot of floating plankton, which would include those small uh, algal um, organisms and bacterial organisms as well. All right, that's it for marine ecology.